Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning and for the opportunity that we can come and worship you and uh, just praise your name. We ask that uh, you be with me uh, during the sermon today, that uh, what I have to say is what you want people to hear. We ask that you bless us during this worship service. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody please stand.
in 112 verses, the different kinds of uh, types of birds are given in more specific names, such as cocks in 11 verses, which we know as rooster chickens, cranes in two verses, doves in 18 verses, eagles in 25 verses, ostrich in one verse, owls in 12 verses, pelicans in five verses, pigeons in two verses, ravens in six verses, sparrows in five verses, swallows in 28 verses, and swans in two verses. Today, I would like us to meditate or reflect on the real realization that even though one kind of bird called a sparrow is one of the smaller birds that God created and was considered to be of no great value by man in biblical times, as it was mentioned in Matthew and Luke in the New Testament. God said he is aware when each sparrow dies and not one of them is forgotten before God. So God considers each sparrow and even the sparrows are of great value to him. Today, I would like us to meditate or reflect on the realization that even though we humans are small in this planet as well as the universe, we also are of great value to God. We have the opportunity to become a member of God's family and be able to live forever in his heavenly kingdom. Even though we have become sinful in this world, if we repent, God is merciful and will forgive us and sparing us from immediate death because of the sacrificial blood of God's Son. He suffered and died to save us from the penalty of our sins. He gave up his life on earth so that we could one day be free from the bondage of sin. According to the Bible, God spoke of his complete satisfaction, love, and care toward his total creation. He expressed his attentive love toward man and each of his creatures. He stated that he is aware of the death of each of his creatures. We read in Luke 12, 6 and 7, it says, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more valued than many sparrows. King James Version. At the time of that writing, of those scriptures, a farthing was considered in value as a half penny, or a farthing in the original was the tenth part of the Roman penny. This statement is affirmed again in Matthew 10 31, where it stated, Fear ye not, therefore ye are more valued than many sparrows. Well, when a pre teenager, I admit that I did not respect the sparrows. They became target game for my BB gun or air rifle practice. They would make their nests in the corners outside our house and barn, making a mess wherever they chose to have their bathrooms. Then as a young adult, having accepted Jesus as my friend and savior, I repented of my cruel actions toward the sparrows. Thereafter, the sparrows became highly respected because I learned at the time of my mother's funeral that one of her favorite songs, as announced by her good friend, the preacher's wife, as she got up in front of the church to sing, his eyes are on the sparrow. Now, I love that song. And next time you hear it, and you hear the words, and Barbara does a beautiful job of presenting that message to us in the song. Uh, just makes me talk, I cry. My tears start rolling out of my eyes, Barbara, when you sing that. Because now we realize how important a sparrow is to God. Then as we travel to the cemetery and approach the building for the graveside service, we heard the loud chirping or singing of a sparrow that had flown into the building some time before and was perched up on the cross and was attached to the wall, front wall of the speaker's platform. On that cross was a sparrow chirping and singing, welcoming us to the building. In my sadness, I felt a warm comfort feeling deep within my being, assuring me that all is well and in God's hands. At the service, as the service was about to begin, the sparrow flew out of the front door as the late King of Commerce entered, and the sparrow was not observed again. I will not forget that eventful day and how God, through the beautiful voice and song of my mother's dear friend, 
and through the life and song of a tiny sparrow, spoke to my soul, giving me gladness and comfort of heart and fond memories. Think or meditate on this. God chose to create earth and all the other things for our good pleasure and asked us to be the caretakers. In addition, he only asked for our fellowship and our belief in him. In spite of our neglect, disobedience, and rejection, he chose to send his son, Jesus, the almighty Christ, to come to this earth to walk with and to communicate to humans in person. His word, his instruction, his teaching, his guidance, his healing, his promises, his love, everything for our own good. Then he gave up his life on this earth as a sinless God man, living sacrifice to a worthy and just creator to pay the penalty for all our individual sins. It is my belief that if we would read his scriptures and silently meditate concerning him and his scriptures more often, we would be able to hear the soft, encouraging voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to our soul, telling us what we need to hear. It is in that same belief that we all pause in this worship service today to hold spiritual communion with Christ our Lord and Savior and join him in commemorating his life, his sacrifice, his resurrection, and to perform a holy ordinance that has been identified as his last supper on earth.
Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we gather around the stage and the sacrifice you made, sending your Son to die on the cross so that one day we can get back. We ask that you help us take this communion with open minds and open hearts and to love you. In your Son's name we pray.
Heavenly Father, you give us so much, Lord. We ask that you help us to take this amount that we give back to spread your word. So let me pray.
advance because no other nation in the history of civilization has done more to advance the human condition than the United States. America has been at the forefront of technological advancement, from the discovery of electricity to the invention of the light bulb, from Morse code to cell phones, from the electronic calculator to the personal computer, the microchip to the microwave, and so on and so on. American ingenuity has made the world safer, smaller, and more productive. We've also been a world leader in medical technology, pharmacology, and the prevention of diseases. The blood bank, the defibrillator, the CAT scan, the MRI, a cardiac pacemaker are all American inventions, as are genetic engineering, the first use of, first use of anesthetic, the first use of antiseptic, and on and on. America is a liberator of the oppressed and a helper of the poor around the world. No other nation on earth is as charitable, both as a people and as a nation, as the U.S. No other nation has sacrificed more in blood and treasure to stop the advancement of imperialism, fascism, or communism. There are no other so eager to defend the helpless or so willing to take up a just cause for others. American idealism is the hope of peoples around the world. Principles of truth, justice, freedom of expression, self-determination are admired universally by all but the most cynical of hearts. The idea of American exceptionalism is not self-described. It's plain for all the world to see. We're not envied merely for our prosperity, but for our character. And to what do we owe this tremendous prosperity? Not to our own innovation or ingenuity, not to our creative endeavors, not to luck or fate, but to the providence of God. God's divine intervention in the founding of the nation is plain, plain to see. Our history as a nation is replete with examples of God's divine intervention from even before our founding, from Columbus to George Washington, from the early Puritan settlers to the Battle of the Bulge. Americans have asked for and received God's blessing and protection. That this nation's greatest triumphs were examples of the hand of God at work in the lives of those men and women is evident not only from their successes, but from their writings, being convinced in their own minds that this was the case. I want to read a little bit to you from Washington's first inaugural address, and I want you to pay close attention to it because we don't speak like this anymore. And it's brilliant. It would be peculiarly, peculiarly improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe, who presides in the councils of nations, and whose providential aids can supply every human defect, that his benediction may, cons may consecrate to the liberties and happiness of the people of the United States a government instituted by themselves for these essential purposes and may enable every instrument employed in its administration to execute with success the functions allotted to his charge. In tendering this homage to the great author of every public work and private good, I assure myself that it expresses your sentiments not less than my own, nor those of my fellow citizens at large less than even. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than those of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token of providential agency. And in, a, and in the important revolution just accomplished in the system of their united government, the tranquil deliberations and voluntary consent of so many distinct communities from which the event has resulted cannot be compared with the means by which most governments have been established without some return of pious gratitude, along with a, a humble anticipation of future blessings, which the past seems to presage. These reflections arising out of the present crisis have forced themselves too strongly on my mind to be suppressed. There was no doubt in Washington's mind that if it were not for God, we would have lost the revolution. 
Washington himself was shot at at nearly point blank range seven times. He was never hit. The night they were about to be captured uh, on Long Island, they were surrounded. There was no way out. But that night a fall came over the land and they slipped out across the water, unseen. You couldn't convince Washington that Providence didn't have something to do with the founding of our nation. But if we have a higher calling, what is our purpose? Well, I believe it's threefold. And number one, to advance the gospel. Two, to protect the nation of Israel. And these first two reasons are vitally important, make no mistake. For we all understand that the primary act of obedience to our Lord is in the carrying out of the Great Commission. And no nation on earth has done more to bring the message of the gospel to the nations than we have. Likewise, I don't think anyone doubts that without the United States, the nation of Israel could not exist as we know it. But there's a third reason that I want to concentrate on in this sermon because it's not one I've ever really heard expressed. And to tell you the truth, I, it was an idea that this week I had somewhere in the back of my mind, but I didn't really recognize it. I didn't know really how to put it into words. But uh, after being in prayer about it this week, something like this. I believe one of the purposes that God has brought us together as a nation and the manner in which we govern ourselves is to demonstrate to the world the virtues of liberty. If you turn with me to chapter to uh, chapter 8 of Hebrews, um, this is a concept that, that um, that I'm basing this opinion on. The writer's talking about the earthly tabernacle and how it's just a, a foreshadow of better things to come, which would be you know, dwelling in heaven. And he says, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle in which the Lord pitched and not man, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices whereof it is in Whereof, where it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if we were here on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses has admonished of God, was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. It goes on to say in chapter 9 that, um, that the tabernacle, while it was yet standing, was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And so on. See, I believe that just as the earthly tabernacle of the Old Testament and as well as Solomon's temple wasn't imperfect form of the ideal as Plato would explain. So is this nation an imperfect example of the new Jerusalem and the liberty found in Christ. We are the city on a hill. In the year 1630, John Winthrop preached a sermon from the deck of a ship headed to the new world in which he said, now the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions your own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work, our community as members of the same body, so shall we keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as His own people and will command a blessing upon us in all our ways so that we shall see much more of His wisdom, power, goodness, and truth than formerly we have been acquainted with. 
we shall find that the God of Israel is among us. When ten of us shall be able to resist thousands of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and a glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England, for we must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that we shall deal falsely with our own, with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us. We shall be made a story and a byword through the world. We shall open up the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God and all the professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whether we are going. Winthrop goes on to preach to his, to his I guess, congregation, the passengers on the ship, and to spur them on towards good works. He goes on to say, If our hearts, though, shall turn away so that we will not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasures and prophets, and serve them, it is propounded unto us this day, we shall surely perish out of the good land whether we possess over this vast sea. I fear now America's greatness may be near an end. For far too long, the majority has been silent. The principles that guided our founders and helped to shape our nation have all been forgotten by too many of our citizens, and each generation seems to drift further away from the ideals that made this country great. The ideas of family, faith, a strong work ethic, and individual responsibility have been eroding steadily only to, be, only to be replaced by moral relativism, selfishness, ignorance, and an attitude of entitlement and blame. And who is to blame for this decline? Mostly we are. We have been fooled into thinking that it was always someone else's responsibility to teach our children, to hold our elected officials accountable, care for the less fortunate in our society, and so on. As a result, our children are more ignorant, our politicians more corrupt, and our people more reliant on the government than they are on God. While we were sleeping, the enemy was at work, planning, scheming, and finding ways to convince people that our ways are no good, that somehow God's precepts aren't just. Make no mistake, there are enemies among us, men who subtly pervert God's truth into a lie, men who would undo this great nation in order to satisfy their own evil desires. But there are also those who are just plain ignorant, not knowing or holding to the truth. They are not malicious evildoers. They just don't know right from wrong. Either way, both groups are under the influence of Satan, and both are dangerous. Even a gentle seed can turn deadly if enough wind is applied to it. See, it seems to me lately, and I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the whole world is upside down. Uh, the things we shouldn't do, we do, and vice versa. We take prayer out of school and call it freedom of religion. We allow filth to permeate our airways and call it freedom of speech. We steal from others and call it social justice. And we kill the innocent call it the right to privacy. Likewise, everywhere you look, you see our individual freedom being eroded away. Our government gets bigger and more intrusive, while our opportunity for prosperity gets smaller. Our elected officials ignore the will of the people, so our voices get smaller. And our religion is banned from the public arena, so that our worship gets smaller. And if we are opposed, we are labeled intolerant, or bigoted, or worse, so we begin to lose hope that we can make any effectual change. Yes, friends, despotism, censorship, corruption, these are the order of the day. Not to mention the trampling of our Constitution, the supreme law of the land, the undermining of our ability to achieve economic prosperity, the indoctrination of our children in schools by those who would rewrite history and a general undermining of the Judeo-Christian values that this country was founded on. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, 
that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5.20. Our founding fathers warned us about all this. Being students of history, they were all too aware of the tendencies of governments toward despotism and of peoples toward complacency. John Adams said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration, a signer and, and, uh, and one of our main founding fathers, he was a minister, said the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in, a, in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue. Without virtue, there can be no liberty. And liberty is the object and life of all Republican governments. Daniel Webster says, if we in our posterity reject religious instruction and authority, violate the rules of eternal justice, trifle with the injunctions of morality, and recklessly destroy the political constitution which holds us together, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and shall bury all our glory in profound obscurity. An early preacher in the, in the, in the beginning of our country, in 1803, preached a sermon. His name was Matthias Burnett. And I just want to take a little piece of that. Because I think he, amazing as it is, to uh, you know, 200 some odd years ago, they had a very good grasp of history. They had a great grasp of natural progression of humankind. He said this, Consider well the important trust which God has put into your hands. To God and posterity you are accountable for your rights and your rulers. Let not children have reason to curse you for giving up those rights and prostrating those institutions which your fathers have delivered you. Look well to the characters and qualifications of those you elect and raise to office in places of trust. Think not that your interests will be safe in the hands of the weak and ignorant or faithfully managed by the impious, the dissolute, and the immoral. Think not that men who acknowledge not the providence of God nor regard His laws will be uncorrupt in office. Firm in defense of the righteous cause against the oppressor or resolutely oppose the torrent of iniquity. Watch over your liberties and privileges, civil and religious, with a careful eye. I believe America is the world's last best hope for bringing light to a dark world. And we must not give up the fight. Remember, God is the creator of both heaven and earth, and He is still in control. But we know the Prince of Darkness has already met His end. So what do we do? How do we change this? First of all, we need to be in prayer. We need to be commonly united with a single voice in prayer. Praying for our country and its leaders. We need to pray that God would raise up men and women of courage and conviction, people that do not seek power but seek to glorify God and do His will. You need to pray for your friends and your family and your neighbors that they would recognize God's authority and seek to do His will. We need to train, teach, educate, organize, and vote. This is not a dictatorship we live under. We're not in a communist country in the third world. We have choices. The question is whether or not we're too lazy to engage. Finally, we need to live as, as examples to everyone we know, everyone you come in contact with. Let us be the instruments of God's will in this country. The first verse I read to you from the book of Isaiah was quoted by Jesus. He read <clears throat> Matthew 5.13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for, good for nothing, 
but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And as pertaining to liberty, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 5.1, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It's hard to it's hard to uh, bring light into a dark world unless you have the light. Every week we offer a hymn of invitation. Uh, we give you an opportunity to come down for maybe you are not a Christian. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. Ago. Maybe you're a Christian, but your walk with the Lord hasn't been what it should what it should be. Maybe you kind of drifted away and need to find a way to get back. This is your opportunity to come down um, in prayer, in prayer before this congregation, and either dedicate your life to Christ or rededicate, whatever the case may be. If we're to be the light of the world, we have to have the light. You have to allow Jesus to come into your heart and ignite that fire. We can be as smart as we want. We can be as engaging, as personable as we want. Unless you have the Word of God in your heart, you're not going to win anybody over. Oh God, you are my God.